Asmat Guru Bhyan Maha, Asmat Parama Guru Bhyan Maha, Asmat Sarva Guru Bhyan Maha. So we're continuing on with Hari Bhakti Vilas, 10th Vilas. And in the 10th Vilas, we were just talking about the time of the day when we are finished our puja and we are, um, we, we have, uh, we've taken prasadam and we're going to, uh, you know, we've done, we've maybe we've spent a little time um, uh, earning our living in, in some sattvic way. And now the Vaishnava is going to spend his time studying the scriptures, which is called Swajaya, which is one of the five, five parts of the, of the day, uh, Abhigamana, uh, Upadana, Ija, Swajaya, and Yoga. And during the Swajaya time or this study time where you can study and teach the scriptures, you want to have the association sometimes of other people. Either um, you're learning from somebody who's a more, uh, a more knowledgeable Vaishnava, or you're associating and you're studying together with, with other, uh, you know, equal Vaishnavas, or you're teaching some other person something uh, who's also a Vaishnava. And so we want to know about all these different types of Vaishnavas. So there was a lot about um, the qualities of different types of Vaishnavas and associating with Vaishnavas in the last session. So now, uh, now let's uh, let's have a look at the at the text and see where we're at. Okay, so um, this is where we left off. Um, Hari Bhakti Vilas, tenth Vilas, text four sixty. Ata means a, a, another another section, another uh, a small section is get, we're, we're going to talk about. Ata Sri Bhagavad Kata Tyagadi Doshaha. So uh, doshaha means the fault, uh, the fault of neglecting to hear narrations about the Lord. So Bhagavad Kata means means the stories about the uh, the pastimes of the Lord, right? The story about the Lord. So, uh, for instance, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, "Janma karma, chame divyam." Divyam means divine. Janma karma, my my birth, meaning my appearance in this material world, Krishna. Doesn't really take birth, but he 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 descends from his divine abode, Goloka Vrindavan. He comes here and and he performs his earthly pastimes, which are called in Sanskrit pra, prakat lila or pra, prakrit lila, right? So the, the the lila means the play that he puts on here with his devotees. So um, uh, so Janma Karma Chamedivyam. So his my birth and my activities, he says to Arjuna in the Gita are divine. They're divine. And by remembering those things, we can attain the highest good. We can attain uh, to the devotional service of the Lord in, in, uh, in Goloka. We can attain, uh, we, can, we can become Krishna conscious, which will lead us back to God. Back to God and back to Godhead. So um, here, the saying there's a fault in neglecting this. So if you, maybe there are some Vaishnavas, they just get up and they and they do their puja and everything. They finish everything. They have prasadam, and then they then they go off to do something else, maybe earn their living or something. And they completely neglect throughout the day this section of swadhyaya, this section where we're supposed to think about, we're supposed to read and study uh, the scriptures, either in the association of devotees or with our family or or even alone. But we're supposed to perform this. Uh, this uh, remembrance of the Lord by 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 uh, hearing and hearing and chanting and remembering the pastimes and the activities of the Lord. So there's a fault if we if we neglect this. If we neglect this, there's a fault, and so we're going to talk about that fault. So in the third canto of the Bhagavatam, uh, in a conversation between Lord Kapila and Devahuti, right? Um, in uh, Sri Bhagavatam three. 32.19, it said, those who reject hearing about the transcendental pastimes of the Lord and indulge in hearing about all kinds of abominable activities performed by materialistic people are comp compared to stool-eating hogs. Stool-eating hogs, okay? So they have a system, they have a system in India, uh, ancient system where they have um, these trenches you know, which open trenches, slit trenches, uh, behind the houses. It ha it's there in my house in Sri Rana that run down, uh, that run along the back of all these houses and people would have their outhouse. They would have their bathroom. 
their toilet in the back of the house and, uh, and the stool and urine all flows into a trench and it would be flow, flow away by gravity. It would flow away from the, from the town, from the, from the, from the uh, built up area of the town, the neighborhood. Okay, so it, it's there in Vrindavan also. It's a similar sort of thing like that. And then they have a certain class of people who go and clean that and make sure that that, that, uh, that sewage line um, goes properly, properly flows and, and flows away from the, uh, from the town. So uh, those people um, in North India are called bungies and they're considered very low-class sudras. And those bungies, they also have... Um, they have these animals to help them. They have pigs, you know, these hogs and pigs that they, that help them. So they'll, they'll, they have a, they have a stick with a scoop on the end of it to help, you know, or a shovel or something like that to make sure that the whole thing is flowing. The same thing in tree running. And they, and they have, and they have this animal that they send down. The animal actually enjoys eating stool, enjoys eating the uh, feces of, of, of people in the neighborhood. I, I, you know, maybe it's not a, very nice topic to talk about, but here it's mentioned in the scripture, okay? So it's comparing people who only want to hear. There are some people, they only want to hear what we call Gramyakata. Gramyakata, the word Gram, Brahma, means village, means a little village. So Gramyakata means gossip. It means just, just uh, hearing about materialistic things that have no... No, uh, no, uh, no relationship whatsoever to anything spiritual, right? Just, just, uh, just about materialistic persons. Just about eating, sleeping, you know, mating, defending. About you know all these sorts of sorts of basic animalistic topics, and topics about this material world, right? Things that have to do with the body. Things that have to that, are, that all this 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 type of mentality keeps us here in this material world, right? So people who are only interested in that sort of um, remembrance, instead of remembering the glorious pastimes and, and activities and birth of the different avatars of the Lord, right? Those people are compared to those type of stool eating hogs, right? In this verse, I mean, it's a very graphic, very graphic description of people who are. Not interested in that. So, uh, next in uh, 461, this verse is found in the description of the glories of Sri Vaikuntha, the spiritual world, and it's found in Srimad Bhagavatam 315.23. It is very regrettable that unfortunate people do not discuss the news from Vaikuntha, but instead engage in talking about things that are unworthy to hear and which bewilder one's intelligence. Those who give up talk of Vaikuntha and instead relish talks of the material world are thrown into the darkness region of ignorance. Right. So this is also a very simple test. Very simple test if you're associating with people and association, which is called Sadhu Sangha, right? Associating with devotees or Vaishnavas is called Sadhu Sangha. Sangha means to associate. And sadhu is an eternal person or a, or a Vaishnava, a, a spiritually advanced person. So, uh, so associating with people who are spiritually minded is very important. And associating with people who are not spiritually minded is the opposite to that. It's, very, it's, it's a big fault and, it's a, and it, can, it can bewilder our intelligence. It can keep us here in this material world. So we have to always be on guard for this. Right, especially if we have that, you know, we have some time in the day, you know, here what's being recommended is that we discuss about the Lord's activities, even not just his activities here in the material world, but even his activities in the spiritual world. So there are these um, in terms of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, you have you have these uh, seed slokas of Krishna's Kaviraj in Govinda Lila Mrita, which describe the Astakaliya Lila of the Lord. So the Lord is in, in the spiritual world and, and, and we imagine or we meditate upon uh, his eternal eightfold um, daily pastimes. And so we're here in this material world and we can, during the day, during the day and the night, we can think, oh, 
at this time, Krishna is doing this. At this time, of course, there's no day and night in the Lok of Vrindavan, or maybe there's an appearance of day and night, but it's not the same as the, the day and night that we have here in this material world. Um, because there's always eternally certain activities going on. So we can't say, you know, there's no, the time is, is relative only here in this material world. There it's absolute. So, so um, but still, we can meditate. We can meditate upon not only the Lord's activities when he was here, when he appears in, in different avatars here in this material world, but we can also think of his eternal, his nitililas. And this is the system of Lila Smarna. This is a system in Raghunuda Bhakti. So um, now it's interesting here that it says people are unfortunate. People do not discuss the news from Vaikuntha. So the thing about the news from Vaikuntha is it's not like it's not like uh, different things happen all the time. The same thing is happening all the time. The service of the Supreme Lord is going on eternally in Sri Vaikuntha or in Goloka Vrindavan in in certain set ways, like that. Okay. Uh, also, who, who are we supposed to hear this news from? Nobody can go there and come back, right? Because once having gone there, one stays there. So, so of course, it's a very poetic, poetic statement here in the Bhagavatam because we can't hear the news from Vaikuntha because people don't come from Vaikuntha. They, when they go to Vaikuntha, it's a one-way trip. They stay there and they stay there forever serving the Supreme Lord. So similarly with Goloka Vrindavan. So... Uh, it's interesting that that they put it in this way to hear discuss the news from Vaikuntha, but what it really what it means is when we say discuss the news from Vaikuntha, we can read in the scriptures. We can read we can read the the Lord's the Lord's pastimes in Goloka Vrindavan, his eightfold pastime, eightfold daily pastimes. We can we can read about um, we can read about the the pastimes of the Lord in Vaikuntha. We can read about all those things, and we can meditate upon those things. And it's for the Vaishnava, it's meditating on the goal. What is the goal of life? The goal of life is to go there, is to, is to be an eternal servant of the Lord and to serve the Lord in loving service you know, for eternity. So that is the goal, and that's what we should meditate on. If we meditate on other things, if we meditate upon being in this material world, then we'll stay in this material world. Krishna says that in the Gita very clearly. He says, those who worship the forefathers go to the forefathers. Those who worship you know, the demigods go to the demigods. One, those who worship me will come to me. Those who think about me will come to me, right? If you want to, if, what, yum, yum, the peace, manam, bhavam, whatever a great, you know, whatever you think of at the time of death, that you will attain also, uh, right? The culmination of the things that we think about in this lifetime culminates at the time of death. We think about what is the most important thing to us in our life. And if the most important thing was, watching soccer or football or, 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 or thinking about women or whatever, whatever it is in our minds, if that's the most important thing to us, you know, then that's what we'll think of at the time of death and that's what we'll attain, Krishna says. Krishna says, if that's what you think of at the time of death, that's your desire, then I grant that desire in your next life. Like that. If we think of Krishna, if we think of the, the spiritual master, if we think about spiritual things, so we think about the... The, uh, the wonderful pastimes of the Lord, then surely we'll attain, we'll attain that destination, we'll attain that goal. So continuing on, 462 to 464, in a conversation between Lord Brahma and Narada, which is reported in the Skanda Purana, the following verses are found. O foremost sages, those lowest amongst, uh, among mankind, who do not lend an ear to Vaishnava literature certainly become residents of hell. Those who do not hear the topics of Lord Vishnu, in spite of getting an opportunity to do so, and do not express happiness at the prospect of hearing such topics, decrease their duration of life, decrease their wealth, decrease their fame, decrease religious principles and good fortune of their children, right? So there's all these, all these negative aspects to not being attracted to listening to the Vaishnava literature and to listening to the pastimes and, and, and appearance and pastimes and different uh, uh, pastimes of the Lord here in, in, in the spiritual world as well. Of course, these pastimes are very attractive. So if we just, even if we don't have any attraction in the beginning, if we just practice the listening to the pastimes of the Lord, we will ultimately will become more and more attractive. 
O Narada, anyone who shows no interest in hearing the narrations of Lord Hari's transcendental pastimes, will, which destroy all sinful reactions, face, faces ruination. He will be spiritually ruined. So it's, it's sort of a, a condemnation here, definitely a condemnation here that, you know, to say that if you don't, if you don't listen to these wonderful topics about the Lord, you'll go to hell and you'll face spiritual ruination. So text 465, Sage Shonaka, um, Shonaka spoke this verse in Shri Bhagavatam, second canto, third chapter, verse 20. One who, never, one who has never listened to the narrations of the wonderful pastimes of the personality of Godhead and has not chanted devotional songs about the Lord is to be considered as possessing ears like the holes of a snake and tongue like that of a frog. Okay, so this is a very, very, very nice poetic analogy here in the Bhagavatam. Okay, so, so normally we think of ears as as helping us to, what are the ears for? The ears are for helping us hear. So if we just have little holes, if we don't have, you know, when you have these big ears, like elephants, if you have a big ear, it's, you know, you think, oh, the elephant must be able to hear very well because it has a huge ear, very big ear. But if, you, if you're like a snake and you have just a small, little ear like this, how can you hear? You can't hear properly because you don't have the proper organ to hear with. And similarly, Similarly, a frog has a tongue, but the frog doesn't use his tongue properly. The frog uses his tongue just to, 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 to catch bugs, to eat, or, or do something else. He doesn't use his tongue properly to, to speak the glories of, of the Lord, right? So a person who never, um, who never listens to the wonderful pastimes of the personality of Godhead, he doesn't have proper ears. His ears are useless, actually. And, and if he doesn't chant or if he doesn't sing the glories of the Lord or, or about the Lord's past ones, then his tongue is useless. It's just, it's, just, it's just a flapping piece of skin in his, in his mouth, right? So this is what the Bhagavatam is saying. Look, we have frogs and we have snakes, and they are also wasting their time. They're not listening to the, to the, the snakes are not listening to past times of the Lord. The frogs are not chanting about his glories. So... You are you no know, a person who, who is just interested in material topics, hearing and chanting about material topics. That person is no better than a snake or a frog. It's a really very, very nice um, analogy. 466. Lord Brahma offered this prayer to the Supreme Lord, which is found in Sri Bhagavatam, third canto, ninth chapter, seventh verse. Oh, my Lord, those who have never engaged. In chat, and by the way, in this previous verse here, it was saying, uh, one verse back, it was saying, in spite of getting the opportunity to do so. So, so many people, they get the opportunity to hear about the, the Lord and hear about the Lord's pastimes. Even they get an opportunity and they don't take advantage of it. They're going to go to hell. Because there are some people who are, maybe there are people living out in the jungles, they don't have an opportunity to hear about about Krishna and Krishna's pastimes. So those people we can understand, we can't blame them. Eventually, Krishna will, will, will make it so that they, you know, have some possibility to hear about his pastimes. But right now, they can't because they're not, they're not in contact with any Vaishnavas or any scriptures, right? But those people are especially sinful who had the opportunity and disregarded that opportunity. That's another thing that I wanted to say about Text 464. Now, text 466. Sorry, getting back to this. Oh, my Lord, those who never engage themselves in chanting or hearing about your transcendental pastimes are certainly very unfortunate and are also without good sense. They engage in inauspicious activities, enjoying sense gratification for a very little while. Text 467. In Sri Bhagavatam, third canto, fifth, fifth, ver uh, fifth chapter, Verse 14, it's stated, O sage, those who are averse to the narrations of the Lord's glories because of their sinful mentality are to be pitied by the pitiable. Wow. I also pity them because I see how their duration of life is being spoiled as they engage in mental speculation, inventing some useless goal of life. 
So that's uh, that's uh, an interesting um, an interesting phrase there. Pitied by the pitiable, people who are the lowest, who are who who we have pity on because they are so low. Even those people will feel pity for the people who are not interested in the narrations, or they're actually averse. Not only they're not interested in the Lord's glories, but they are actually against them. They are averse to them. Wow. Uh, text uh, 468, Sri Maitreya spoke this verse in Srimad Bhagavatam, 3rd Canto, 13th chapter, verse 50. Who, except those in lower forms of life, can exist in this world without being interested in the ultimate goal of life? Who can refuse to hear the wonderful narrations about the personality of Godhead's activities, which are sufficient to deliver one from material, uh, material miseries? So this is what we call um, rhetorical questions. They're not meant to be answered. The idea is by asking this question, which we're, we're asking these questions, we're showing that nobody, nobody really should in this material world should be averse to, to listening about the glories of the Lord. Everybody should be interested in the, in the goal of life. Everybody should inter be interested in the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna's activities. Because those are going to actually deliver us from our material miseries. Right? People don't realize that. They think they can try and enjoy in this material world um, without, without, uh, without getting uh, at the root cause of, uh, of our misery. The root cause of our misery is that we don't, we don't serve the Supreme Person. We don't serve Lord Krishna. Right? That's our natural position to eternally serve the Lord. And because we're not doing that, therefore we're miserable. People don't realize that. Text 469, King Pritu offered his, this prayer to the Supreme Lord, found in Kriyam Bhagavatam, 4th Canto, 20th chapter, verse 26. My dear, Lord, my dear Lord, in the association of pure devotees, if one hears even once about your glorious activities, he will not, unless he is worse than an animal, give up their association because no intelligent person would be so foolish. So if we're in the association of devotees and we once hear, we once, once hear from the association of devotees about the Lord's glorious activities, then unless we're a really degraded animal type of person, right, we will never give up those, those uh, pure devotees association and their, and their, uh, and their, uh, because, to give them up would show that we were just, just extremely foolish, extremely foolish. No intelligent person would do this. Nobody, nobody would be so foolish as to give up the association of devotees, right, after once hearing the glorious, um, the glorious glories of the Lord. The importance of chanting and hearing about the, your, your glories uh, uh, was accepted even by the goddess of fortune. So even the goddess of fortune, who is... This, the consort of the Supreme Lord himself, right? And she's so close to him all the time. Even she wants, accepts that the importance of hearing and chanting about his glories. Text 470. King Parikshit made this inquiry at the beginning of the 10th canto of Sri Bhagavata. Glorification of the Lord, and we should find out what the, what the sloka number is, but it doesn't say. Glorification of the Lord should be performed in the Parampara system. Hmm, I don't see the word parampara in the, in, the, in the verse there. But uh, anyway, in the parampara system conveyed from spiritual master to disciple, such glorification is relished by those who are no longer interested in the false temporary glorification of news within the material world. Descriptions of the Lord are the proper medicine for the conditioned soul undergoing repeated birth and death. Therefore, who will not happily listen to the glorification of the Lord except the butcher or one who is killing his own self? One who is killing his own self. So, yeah. So a butcher is very hard-hearted because he has to kill the animals. And a person who's killing his own self, you can kill yourself by, of course, by being engaged in so many material activities. Another way is, uh, is uh, the Vaishnavas consider it to be almost like suicide or killing yourself um, to be 
uh, in the illusion of, of thinking that that you are one with the Lord and that and that to be to be a follower of the Advaita Vedanta, to be a follower of the Mayavadis, right? This is like spiritual suicide, right? Because the goal of the goal of the Jnana Yogis, the go, the, go, the goal of these um, uh, Advaitins or Smartas Mayavadis, right? Their goal is to merge with the Lord. Their goal is Kaivalya. The word Kaivalya means um, the word Kaivalya means isolation in Sanskrit. It means isolation. So basically, they just want to be alone with themselves and simply enjoy the bliss of the soul, which is very little, like that. They don't, they don't want to actively serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna. They don't want to engage in devotional, loving devotional service to the Lord. So that is considered to be almost like spiritual suicide. So, text 471. The demigod spoke this verse in Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, 19th chapter, verse 24. An intelligent person will have no interest in a place, even the, even the heavenly planets, if the pure Ganges of narrations of the Supreme Lord's pastimes does not flow there. If there are no devotees engaged in the service of the Lord on the banks of such river of piety, or if there is no performance of Sankirtana. Sankirtana. The chanting of the holy name of the Lord. So uh, here, the hearing of the uh, of the of the nectarian um, pastimes of the Lord is compared to a river. It's compared to the holy river Ganges, and the devotees who who chant this are considered to be like people who live on the banks of that that river. That river is always available to them, right? If you live on the bank of a river, you don't have to worry about water. So similarly, if you live in the association of the Lord's devotees, you don't have to worry about hearing the glories of the Lord because they're going to be constantly repeating the glories of the Lord and chanting the holy name, performance of Sankirtan. Text uh, 472. Hmm. Text 472. Even if one has repeatedly heard the narrations of the Supreme Lord's glories, he should still inquire about the purport from those who are well-versed in these subjects. This will give both the reader, the speaker, and the hearer great pleasure. Right. So even if you, it, you know, people say, oh, I've read the Bhagavatam before. I've read the Ramayana before. I've read the Mahabharata. I've read all these scriptures. I've read all these pastimes before, you know. But you, sh but you should read them again, and especially we should try to read them with, with, uh, with other devotees who are on our same level or, or more advanced, even more advanced than us or more knowledgeable than us. Right, who are well versed in these subjects, it says. And then, if we do that, we we can we can gain more insight into these. Even just even if even if we're alone and we keep reading the same pastimes of the Lord again and again, reading the Bhagavad Gita over and over again, like that, we get more and more insights. Because remember, in the Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, that knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness, it all comes from Him. So the super soul as Chaitya Guru is there. So even if we're alone. Still, we have a guru with us right within our heart, Lord Krishna. And, uh, and the Chaitya Guru can, can give us realization even from within. So, and that will give, that gives the speaker and the hearer pleasure. The whole, the whole setup of the Bhagavatam is that Maharaj Parikshit is sitting and he's hearing. He's the principal inquirer. Parikshit means inquirer. And Sukha is the parrot. He's the, he's the person who is repeating, repeating the story. Of the of the of, of the glory of the glorious leelas and pastimes of the supreme personality of God, in. he's repeating those things. When he is he's experiencing ecstasy, and so is Parikshit experiencing ecstasy, and everybody else is also hearing Narada is, and Vyasadev, who are who are Sukadev's, you know, um, guru and Param guru, right? They are also sitting there and they're also listening. They're also listening. They're also even though they are the guru and the palm guru, they're also listening to the explanations. They're also deriving great pleasure from this. So everybody, everybody enjoys. Everybody enjoys repeating the narrations of the Lord's glories. So now attachment. Now it's talking about atta, bhagavat kata shaktihi shakti, the power, the the power of of these discussions of the sort. It says here the att attachment for the discussions about the supreme Lord in the tenth canto. 13th chapter, second verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, it says, exalted devotees who have accepted the essence of life are attached 
to Lord Krishna within the core of their hearts, and he is the aim of their lives. It is their nature to talk only about Krishna at every moment, as if such topics were ever fresh. Advanced devotees are attached to speaking about the Lord, just as materialists are attached to discussions of women and sex, right? So it's very interesting, like, if you're in India, and you see, if you go to the West, and you see they try to sell you things in the West, right? Consumer society. So every, everything you see, a car, the car, the, you know, whatever, whatever, the computer, whatever it is like that, there'll be some beautiful woman who is showing the car or driving the car or showing the computer or sh whatever it is that they want to sell you, right? The washing detergent, whatever it is, the food stuff, whatever it is, there'll be some beautiful person there, either a man or a woman like this, to attract the opposite sex like that. Like that. But in India, when you see the, the advertising, even if they're advertising some crazy products, right, they'll have a picture of Krishna or a picture of, you know, Lakshmi or like this to try to, to, try to get people attracted like that. Well, I've seen uh, uh, they have, uh, they have uh, this type of... Uh, Mulberry leaf cigarettes that they that they that they smoke in India. Some people smoke these. They're called beedies. Beedies is the type of uh, uh, cigarette that they make in India. Beedy. It's a very sort of low class cigarette. And they have a they have a brand called Sham Beedies. It has a picture of Lord Krishna on. Beautiful picture of Krishna on the packet, like that. So they're appealing to people people who are devotees of Krishna. Apparently, you know, they're appealing to them. Please buy these beedies, like that. Whereas in the West, they would have, you know, they would have some beautiful spokesman or spokeswoman, you know, showing, showing, the, showing the, the, the product. So it's very interesting here. So he's saying, just as the devotees feel, we feel the same thing when we see a product with a, with a picture of Krishna or something like that. We feel that this is a better product than a, than a product that doesn't have a picture of Krishna like that. Just in the same way as the advertising people in the, in the West, they know that if they have a beautiful woman driving the car, then people will want to buy that car more. Just by the association of, of sex cells, right? Okay. So text uh, 474. Therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, 87th chapter, 11th verse says, one who is equal to friends and enemies, who is equipoised in honor and dishonor, heat and cold, happiness and distress, fame and infamy, who is always free from contaminating association, always silent, and satisfied with whatever comes to him without much endeavor, who doesn't care for any residence, who is fixed in knowledge, and who is engaged in devotional service. Such a person is very dear to me, Lord Krishna says. Nice. So these are all, these are all wonderful um, qualities and, and uh, qualifications that that the Vaishnava devotees have, which are appreciated by the Lord. He, he appreciates that, and he, those devotees are very dear to him. Like that. So text uh, 475 to 476, although one may be very nicely practicing Vaishnava Dharma, he should still inquire about it from other devotees, just to increase their happiness. Huh. If one faithfully uh, inquires about Vaishnava Dharma, a genuine Vaishnava will be very happy to explain it to the best of his capacity. Indeed, to not do so would be an offense. So this is a practice amongst Vaishnavas, is that sometimes, uh, sometimes a Vaishnava, even if he knows the answer to a question, he has a question about Krishna's pastimes or, or about the philosophy of Vaishnavism, he'll ask another person to explain that in the company of others so that he can hear again the, uh, the answer, and, and so others can also benefit from the answer to the question. So constantly, constantly, Prabhupada uh, would be giving lectures on the same things that were, that were there in his books, and he would be lecturing his disciples on the same points that are there in his books, and he'd be reading from his books and lecturing from his books. Even though the disciples can read the books and see the same thing, Still, the lecture would be relishable because he's going over the same thing that's there in the books. So somebody will say, well, why do I need to go to the lecture? Because, because 
it increases your um, it increases their happiness. That's what it says here. It increases our happiness to hear these topics again and again. Text uh, 477. So it's also stated in this, in the, in the, well, it's not a sage here. It's a spelling mistake here. In the age of Kali, when a Vaishnava who asked about Vaishnava Dharma does not bother to give a reply, he will lose the pious merit that he had accumulated during the last 100 births. So uh, this is an interesting, an interesting sloka here saying that that if you're asked a question about a topic of spiritual importance, I, to not give an answer is actually considered an offense and you will lose pious, the pious merit that you accumulated for 100 births, especially in Kali Yuga here, like that. So if somebody's asking about Vaishnava Dharma and you know something, you should explain to the best of your ability. Like that. Even maybe you don't want to, even if you, you know, it's not a topic perhaps that you're, you know, willing to spend, you, you don't really want to spend your time to explain such a topic, whatever it is, you know, it may be a very simple topic for you or maybe a complicated topic that you're not, you're not uh, fully understanding. But by discussing it with other Vaishnavas, right, you can come to a consensus and you can also bring out more interesting facts, more interesting realizations that the other Vaishnavas have and maybe, you know, maybe you can learn something. Even, even when you teach, even the best way to learn something, what's the best way to learn something is to teach it. The best way to learn something is to teach it. If you want to, just like this Hari Bhakti Vilas, if you want to learn this Hari Bhakti Vilas, the best way is to go through it with other people. The best way is to teach it to other people like that. Of course, a teacher never thinks that he's, he understands the, the subject fully. You know, they, they, there's a saying about there, there was this is a famous saying that the first year, the first year medical students think they know everything, and the second year medical students realize they don't know everything, and the third year medical students realize they really don't know anything. So the idea of education is not. Is that, yes, we're learning more and more about, about the Supreme Lord and about his pastimes and his activities. We're getting more and more realizations by going over it again and again and again. But the more we go over it, we also realize how far we are from understanding everything, how, how much we need to do more. How, you know, and we get an appreciation for that and we get a hunger, we get a thirst for, for learning more and more and going through it more and more. When, you know, when you first read Hari Bhakti Vilas and you think, okay, you know, I, okay, now I know Hari Bhakti Vilas. I read it one time. No, read it again and again and again. Read the scripture of Bhagavad Gita again and again and again. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to South India, he met one devotee who was sitting and he was even illiterate. He couldn't properly pronounce the, the slokas of Bhagavad Gita. He was, he was functionally unable to really study it properly. But he understood enough. He understood enough about the Gita to have in his mind the idea of how great was Lord Krishna's um, mercy on Arjuna to drive his chariot and to give him instruction as a guru and to, to, to take him slowly through all the different um, aspects of, you know, karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, and explain all these things so, so nicely to him, which, of course, is, is explaining for all of us. But... But how, what's the mercy of the Lord to come and actually do that himself personally, the Supreme Personality of Godhead to send himself to teach us, right? We don't, have to, we don't have to find a teacher or find a school or something like that. God comes himself and he, and he explains. He explains these things to us in very simple terms. So he, this devotee that Lord Chaitanya met, he was, he was crying, he was weeping thinking uh, of the compassion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead to come here to this material world and do this. So um, definitely, definitely we have, to, we have to bother if somebody asks a question, right? If somebody asks us a question about Vaishnava Dharma, we have to try to answer it to the best of our ability. All questions are good. See, look, there are also, they say, um, 
I think it's a Buddhist, there's a Buddhist saying, there are six ways to answer a question, right? One is not to answer it at all. One is to un- answer it with a question, right? Somebody asks you a question, you ask them a question back. You don't have to give the answer. You just have to ask another question back to them, right? These are all, these are all different techniques for answering questions. But the correct way, the correct, the best way to answer a question is to take it seriously. Take all questions seriously. And because the person who, a person who sincerely asks a question, or even if he's not so sincere, and he asks a question which is not so sincere, still, still, you, the person who's answering the question can expound, can give an answer, which benefits not only the person who is, who is uh, asking the question, but also the other people who hear the answer also. So it's very important when you discuss within, with, between Vaishnavas and even between Vaishnavas and other non-Vaishnavas, it's very important that we take all of these questions seriously. So there's a, even in the age of Kali, there'll be so many questions. Some people will ask us a question and they ask us a question, they're just trying to catch us out. They want to get us to say something and then they criticize us because this is the age of quarrel and discord. So a lot of times people ask you a question what they really want is a fight. They, don't, they want an argument. They don't want a proper discussion. They don't want vada. They don't want to learn something. They don't want to enlighten everybody by asking that question. Now, Vaishnavas, we should ask questions so that other people can be enlightened and we can also be enlightened. They are the type of questions that we should ask. But there are some people, they ask the question just to get, get you know, get the, uh, get, to fluster the person who's, who's answering the question or to, to make them make a mistake or to, to get them to say something outrageous just so they can criticize like that and make an argument or they can you know, disregard the person because they know that he's going to say something and they're going to disregard. So we want to fight. We want to have an argument. We don't want it. We don't care what you say, right? We're just asking you this question because we don't really want to know. We just want to make some problem. We just want to create some difficulty and, or show, show how, um, show how um, your bad qualities in some way, right? So that's, that's, there are envious people who do that many times. But Vaishnavas are not like that. They're the opposite of that. We should always guard against that. You know, we may, sometimes we may feel like giving a, an answer to somebody, you know, a very offhand answer to somebody because we don't care about their question. We don't care about them. We don't care about their question. We may feel like that. We shouldn't feel like that. As Vaishnavas, we should always take all the questions seriously. And we should try to answer them in the best way possible, especially for that person. Not if we know that person, we should answer them in the best way possible for that person. The truth should be spoken. Uh, satyam eva jayati. Satyam, truth will win. Truth will win out. Satyam eva jayati. Nam but it should be spoken also in a palatable way. So we should not only answer the question, but we have to answer it in a full and correct and in a nice way if we can. Sometimes, of course, the truth may hurt. If, you, if there's some truth and if people push and ask the question again and again and again and again, and again like this, then sometimes we have to, even in the Upanishads, we find that in Kato Upanishad. Uh, I don't know if anybody's read Kato Upanishad, but in Kato Upanishad, there's a boy called Nachiketas. And Nachiketas has a father, and his father, his father thinks that he's doing some uh, ritualistic activities. His, his father is giving donations of cows to Brahmins to get punya, because he wants to go. To, he wants punya. He wants to go to the heavenly planets. He wants to. He wants something. So he wants some material um, good karma. So he's giving donations of cows to Brahmins. But in the Upanishad, it says. That Nachiketas, the boy, was looking at the cows, and these cows were really skinny cows. These were really old cows. These cows are never going to give any milk anymore. These are finished. These cows are retired cows. Okay, they're really sad looking cows. So, so, uh, so sarcastically, the boy says to his father, Who will you give me to? Because a boy, a son, uh, or even a daughter, we can say, the progeny is the most precious thing to the parents, right? The father and mother, you know, they'll give up everything to save their children, right? The children are their most precious possession. So they won't ever give away their children, right? Giving away their children is like giving away their lives, giving away their most precious possession. So 
So obviously these sad cows were not were not Nacho Cates' father's prized possession. He was giving these old cows to somebody because the old cows who are retired, all they do is they eat. They don't give any milk, right? So why would anybody want those? So, he, he, so under the pretext of giving cows to Brahmins, which is supposed to be a pious activity, he was giving these old cows to these Brahmins like that. So Nacho Cates thought, this is not right. He's not right. He should give a nice cow to a Brahmin. He should give a cow that can give milk, a proper cow to a Brahmin like that. So he was thinking, he, does he not, what does he feel about me? I'm his prize, I'm his son. You know, he must love me very much. Who, who will he, if he gives these prize cows, which are not prize actually, to, to, to these Brahmins, who will he give me to? So he said sarcastically to his father, oh, father, who, these cows, eat no grass and, and, and give no milk. Now, they're so old, they can't even eat. Who will you give me to? Who will you give me to? So his father understood the sarcasm, and his father said, father said, oh, my son is being very sarcastic at me like that. So he said, I give you to death. Not to the father said, I give you. He said, basically, he told him, go to hell. He told him, go to hell for what you said. He said, I give you to Yamaraj. I give you to Yama. Go to Yama, like that. So it's interesting. In the Upanishads, the father says, go to hell, basically. But he says, I'd go to Yama, you know, go to Yama. So Nachiketa says, goes to hell, and he goes to see Yamaraj. And Yamaraj is away. And so he sits at, at Yamaraj's door for three days, fasting, waiting for Yamaraj to return. And so Yamaraj returns, and then he realizes that this boy has been sitting at his doorstep and he hasn't greeted him. He hasn't given him a place to sit or anything to drink or to eat for three days. So he's committed a, 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 an infraction. He's committed, a, a, he's broken a rule that you should always uh, be hospitable to the guests. When the guests come, you have, to, you have to sit them down. You have to give them a drink. You have to give them, you know, uh, food. You, know, you have to provide everything for the guests. So this is Atiti, a person that comes anytime to the householder's place. He has to be, he has to be greeted properly. So he realized, Yamaraj re realizes that he didn't greet this person properly. So therefore, that's a big sin on his part. So he says, I give you three wishes, right? It's like a, it's like a story. It's like the genie in the bottle sort of thing. That, uh, Nachiketis, he says, I, I'll give you three wishes. I'll give you three questions. You can ask me three questions and I'll give you the answers. And so the Kato Upanishad goes on when Nachiketis in inquires about the nature of the Supreme, which is what the Upanishads are about with Yamaraj, and Yamaraj being one of the Mahajans, explains it to him. So anybody can go and read the Katha uh, Upanishad, but we're getting off the track here. But here the point is, right, the point is that, that this is important. In Bhagavad Gita it says, Pariprashnena sevaya, that Pariprashnena, you should have a question, right? So not only do we when, we, when we approach a guru or approach a teacher or approach anybody that we want to learn something from or discuss anything with, like that, we should have some questions. We should ask some questions. So many times I went to um, lectures, even with Srila Prabhupada, he'd go to a lecture, and at the end, he would ask, are there any questions? Sometimes you go to people's lectures, and at the end, they don't say that. They don't say, are there any questions? They just say, okay, that's the lecture. Take it. Whatever I gave you, just take it. But Prabhupada would always say, any questions? And... Imagine people were sitting there and Srila Prabhupada was sitting there and they, they were not asking any questions. And I would think, why? Prabhupada is right here in front of you. Guru is right there in front of you. Ask some question. Even if it's a stupid question, even if it's a question that you had answered so many times before, right? Why not take this, this wonderful you know, opportunity to ask the question directly? Directly to Srila Prabhupada, ask him and get his answer directly to you. Like that. So whenever I was there, you know, I would always ask some question. Would always ask, even if it made me look stupid. Like that. Because, because I, you know, I wanted to take the advantage. I wanted to take advantage. Like that. So here, it's very important. It's very important that, 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 uh, so in, the age, in this age of Kali, when a Vaishnava is asked about Vaishnava Dharma, and he doesn't bother to give a reply, 
He's going to lose all his pious activities, all his pious merits for 100 births. It's important. Questions and answers. Is it, all the scriptures that we read, Bhagavatam, Gita, it's all questions and answers. It's all questions and answers. It's all dialogues between the great sages. The sage said this. The other sage said that. You know, one sage, the sage said, tell me about the pastimes of Lord, you know, Hayagriva or Lord Vamana or Lord Krishna. And the other sage says, here it is, you know. So, so this, is, this is what Vaishnavism is all about. It's all about questions and answers. Perfect questions and perfect answers. Beautiful. So continuing on, 478. Atha Shri Bhagavad Dharma Prati Padana Mahatmyam. The glories of preaching the supreme religious principles. In the Skanda Purana, there's a conversation between Lord Brahma and Narada as follows. A qualified Brahmana who preaches the principles of Vaishnava Dharma to another Vaishnava. Obviously, this person is not just a qualified Brahmana, but he's also a Vaishnava, right? Vaishnave, Vaishnavanam, Vaishnavam, Dharmam. Hmm. Right. A qualified Brahmana who preaches the principles of Vaishnava Dharma to another Vaishnava will obtain the merit, the merit of giving the entire earth in charity. Giving everything in charity is not equal to a Vaishnava preaching to another Vaishnava. Preaching is so important. Preaching is so important. As Vaishnavas, we preach to each other. And if there's no one around, we can even preach to ourselves. We can read and we can discuss and we can hear and we can chant by ourselves. And again, the Lord is there within the heart. The Lord is going to give us more realization. He's going to interact with us as Chaitya Guru. So text 479, one who instructs ignorant people in the same literature, this was, this was spoken, the same literature was Skanda Purana. So again, we get this, uh, this discussion here. One who instructs ignorant people about the principles of religion attains the merit one would obtain by giving the entire earth in charity. Did I say that? Hmm. Oh, it looks like it looks like the same thing is being said in two in, in two different in the same literature, Skanda Purana in two different verses. Very good. Okay, so it's confirmed. So now, text 480, Vishnu Dharmotara says, a noble person who preaches the glories of Lord Vishnu to the devotees will receive the merit of giving cows in charity. Okay, so what does Lord Krishna say in the end of Bhagavad Gita, right? Uh, actually, Krishna doesn't say it. I think Sanjaya says it, right? Oh, Krishna, no, Krishna says it. Krishna says uh, um, uh, 1867, right after the Charma Sloka of Lord Krishna, um, chapter 18, verse 66, he says, this, this message should be, should be taught to the devotees. It should not be taught to anybody who's not austere or who's not interested, or who would be offensive like that, but it should be taught to the devotees. It should be taught to the other Vaishnavas like that. So sometimes even the Vaishnavas, they have great, uh, even, even they have great mercy and they teach it to some people who are not, who are not qualified to hear it. They teach the glories of the Lord. They try to preach that to the people who are not. But it takes, you know, one has to be um, careful because he does, we don't want people to blaspheme the Lord. So, therefore, we are careful about the way we preach. And this, is a, th this was explained also about the Madhya Madhikari, that he has this differentiation between the people he hears from and serves, the people that he preaches to, people that he avoids, you know, who are atheistic and who are maybe going to blaspheme the Lord, and people that he worships who are, who are uh, very advanced Vaishnavas. So the noble person who preaches the glories of Lord Vishnu to the devotees will receive the merit of giving cows in charity. Text 481. In the Papa Purana, there's a conversation between Deva Dutta and uh, Vikundala. So even the demigods worship a person who imparts knowledge of Vedic literature to an ignorant person. Such a person is capable of destroying one's bondage in material existence. Text 482. In the Brihad Naradiya Purana, it's stated, one who worships the Supreme Lord associates with saintly persons, discusses transcendental subject matters, and is always ready to give instruction to others, becomes situated on the platform of the Supreme Lord and returns to the supreme abode of the Vishnu, Lord Vishnu. Right. But situated on the platform of the Supreme Lord means that he attains the same qualities as the Supreme Lord, right? Of course, in infinitesimal, not the same quantity, in infinitesimal, um, he's, he's an infinitesimal small, uh, small soul. 
but in a small way. So text 483 and 484, we have already described the principal symptoms of a devotee and in the process, we have revealed some principles of religion. Now we will describe some other religious principles in this connection. Although these principles are clearly mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam, we will repeat them here for the benefit of those who are interested. So now we're going to talk about Bhagavad Dharma, religious principles. Text 485, 487. Atha Bhagavad Dharmaha. Right? So Chandra Sharma spoke these verses that are found in the Dwarka Mahatyam, the Gurus of Dwarka, right? Section of the Kashi Kanda. And I think that is in that may um, that's in some Purana. I'm not sure exactly what maybe Skanda Purana or Padma Purana. And uh, it says here. O oh Lord Krishna, please hear about my intentions. I will not eat anything on a codicy, and I will stay awake that night. So here we're beginning, we're hearing the first, we're starting to hear the first instructions here in, in, in uh, Haribhakti Vilas about, about a codicy and about staying awake at night and fasting all day. So what does it actually say here? Ekadasyam na boktavyam. No eating, no enjoying on the policy. And kartavyo jag, jag, jagara sada, staying awake all night. Yeah. I will regularly worship you and celebrate your festivals. If a kartasi, janmastami, and other festival days are contaminated by, the overlapping, by overlapping another day, even for a moment, I will certainly renounce them for your pleasure. For, for your satisfaction, I will observe the eight Mahadwadasis and cultivate devotional service by means of my life and wealth. Okay, so uh, again, when we were talking about the, the Vaishnava calendar uh, is a lunar calendar, basically a lunar calendar. And in a lunar calendar, a day is for however long the, the lunar titi or the lunar day is. And the lunar day doesn't necessarily correspond to the solar day. A solar day starts at sunrise and ends at the next day sunrise, right? So what we do is when we have an Indian calendar or a panchangam, uh, the lunar day may, whatever lunar day it is at sunrise is considered to be the same lunar day all, all day. Although the lunar day may change during the middle of the day, on the calendar, we put the name of the lunar day that was, that was present at sunrise because that's the beginning of the solar day. So what it's saying here is that sometimes that lunar day can extend over two sunrises, right? So when it, when it, when it extends over two sunrises, then you'll see two, lunar, two days in a row which are named the same. So two, two equatices in a row, two duodices in a row, two astomies in a row, two, two um, lunar days in a row. When that happens, when one is overlapping onto the next day, right? Um, when one is overlapping on the previous day, usually it's the previous day one that, that is not observed for fasting or festival day, but the Vaishnavas will accept. This is a difference in the second day. The second day is more important. So whereas the smartest, those who are not Vaishnavas, will accept the first day as being more important. Okay? So then there are these Mahadwadasis. Mahadwadasis are actually they're, they're, they're days that come after Ekadasi, but um, the Ekadasi is not pure, and so we don't fast on that particular Ekadasi. We fast the next day on the Mahadwadasi. So a Mahadwadasi is not an ordinary Dwadasi. Every time, every day, time there's an Ekadasi, an 11th day, there's a 12th day that comes right after it. But in the case that the 11th day, there's some, something wrong with the calculation, we have to fast on the 12th day only. So that'll be explained. Text 488 to 491. I will recite your 1,000 holy names every day. What does that say? Is that there? Nityam Nama Sahasrantu. Oh. Okay, so it's talking about the chanting of the thousand names of Vishnu, right? Or it could be the thousand names of Krishna. Um, the, all of the different deities, all the different avatars of the Lord and, and many, of his, many of his associates and consorts have lists of, of many names. And, then, and, of course, the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is the Yuga Dharma and Kali Yuga. So here it's talking about the chanting, recitation of the holy name of the Lord. 
not just one holy name, but 1,000 holy names every day. I will worship you with offerings of Tulsi leaves, right? which we discussed before, that Tulsi is the greatest, the greatest leaf to offer. It's the greatest, uh, and Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, offer me a leaf of flower, fruit, and some water and with love and devotion, I'll accept it. So the Tulsi leaf is considered the greatest offering. So, uh, so chanting a thousand names of Vishnu, offering the Tulsi leaves, and I will decorate myself with beads made of Tulsi wood, so Yekantalagna Tulasi Nananakshamala, it's stated right that the Vaishnavas they wear on their neck and on their chest, they wear the 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 the, uh, the lotus seeds and also the Tulsi Mala. The Tulsi has to, the Tulsi has to do with uh, with the Lord Vishnu. And the lotus seeds have to do with Lakshmi, of course. Like that. And then there are other parts of the body that you can also wear, upper body that you can also wear Tulsi on. Right. I will celebrate all auspicious days related to you by chanting and dancing and performing other devotional services. I will smear the pulp of Tulsi wood, Tulsi wood chandan, right, on, on your transcendental body, on, on the body of the deity. We already talked about this before. I will sing your transcendental glories in your presence before the deities. We all, all, also have to offer different prayers. Um, the chanting of the thousand names of Vishnu can be done in front of the deity the chanting of different stotras, especially the great prayers of the great devotees like Mukundamala Stotram or some other prayers of, of, of great uh, Vaishnavas, the prayers of Narottam Das Thakur, like that. So, um, or Bhaktivinoda his, uh, Thakur, his, uh, his wonderful, wonderful prayers and wonderful songs that he wrote. I will visit Mathura every year and I will regularly listen to the narrations of your transcendental pastimes. So going on pilgrimage to the holy places like Mathura, like Dwarka, like, like, uh, like the Purukshetra, like, uh, like Ayodhya, uh, other places, right? I will carefully study Vaishnava literature such as Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is, a, this is great. Where is this from? This seems to be from. Hmm, we don't know exactly. We have to look up again where the Dwarka Mahatmyam and Kashi Kanda is. What, what Purana it's in. Like I said, I thought it was um, Skanda or Apadam Puranas. It's a very nice verse. Text 492 to 493. I will regularly sprinkle the water that has washed your lotus feet over my head with great devotion. When we, after we sip the Charanamrita of the Lord, we sprinkle some on our head or we, we wipe the, the, the excess on our head. Sirasa Dariyamiyaham is what we say. Sirasa means on the head. Sirasa Dariyamiyaham, I hold it. I hold that water on my head. Right? This is a mantra to be chanted. When you check the charnamita and touch it to your head. I will honor the remnants of your food, the prasadam. Right? Mahaprasada Govinde, Nama Brahmani Vaishnavi, Salpapunya Vatanradam, Vishwasonai Vajayate. That one we, the, that we may have very little pious activities that we can do, but we can certainly take the Mahaprasadam. That's most important. And touch the flower garlands, which are also Mahaprasadam, the Niyamalya Prasadam of the Lord. Touch those flower garlands that were offered to you to my head. I will joyfully offer you your favorite things and then accept the remnants of your mercy. So we should find out what Krishna likes and we should offer to Krishna what he likes, what he likes to be offered, what the scriptures say that he likes to be offered and we should accept the remnants of that as his mercy, as Prasadam. Text 494. O oh Lord Krishna, I promise in front of you that I will do whatever is most pleasing to you. So it's a beautiful prayer here, right? So it comes at the end of this. All, all of these things you say, I'm doing all of these things. These are all things that the Lord says that he likes. So when we have somebody that we love, when we have somebody, some friend of ours we want or, or our, uh, or our uh, wife or husband or whatever it is, or our family members or our relatives, we want to please them. And so we do what they want to do, right? We, we, I promise in front of you that I will do whatever is most pleasing to you. Continuing on, text 495 to 496. In the seventh canto, seventh chapter, verses 30 to 32 of Srimad Bhagavatam, Prahlad has spoken the following verses. One must accept a bona fide spiritual master and render serv service unto him with faith and devotion. Whatever is in one's possession should be offered to the spiritual master and in the association of devotees, one should worship the Lord, hear and chant the narrations of the Lord's of his glories, 
and always meditate on his lotus feet and worship the deity strictly according to the prescribed rules and regulations. Right? So this probably mentioned here too. Strictly, we have to worship the Lord according to the rules and regulations. Ishwara aradena, aradena, Ishwara aradena, cha. One should always remember the Lord as Paramatma, as the super soul who is situated in everyone's heart. Thus, one should offer respect to every living entity according to his position. So we, so Brahmani Gavihastini, Suni Cheva Suvapakicha, Pandita Samadarshana, a Pandita, a Vaishnava should be a Pandita, he should be a learned person. He should at least know that within the heart of every living entity is the super soul, and therefore I have to pay my obeisances to all living entities like that. I have to be I have to be respectful and I have to think about the good, the, the good for of all sentient beings. Because all of them carry the Lord within their heart. Uh, in the Bhagavatam, 11th chapter, 11th canto, second chapter, verse 34, Kavi, one of the Navi of Denver's, right, has, uh, has stated, even ignorant persons who can easily come to know the Supreme Lord if they adopt the means prescribed by the Lord himself. This process is known as Bhagavad Dharma, or devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, text 398 to 505. Prabhuddha spoke these verses, which are found in Sri Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, 3rd Chapter, verses 23 to 30. A sincere disciple should uh, practice detaching the mind from everything material while living in the association of devotees. He should be merciful to those. He should be merciful to those in an inferior position cultivate friendship with those on an equal level and very humbly serve those with higher spiritual position. In this way, he should deal with other living beings. While serving the spiritual master, a disciple should practice cleanliness, austerity, tolerance, silence, study of the Vedic literature, simplicity, celibacy, nonviolence, and equanimity towards, equanimity towards material duality, such as heat and cold, happiness and distress. One should practice meditation by constantly seeing oneself as an eternal conscious self and seeing the Lord as the absolute controller of everything. To facilitate one's meditation, one should live in a secluded place and give up all attachment to one's temporary family situation. Giving up all attempts to decorate the temporary material body, one should dress himself in old discarded cloth or tree bark. There's a type of tapa. Um, cloth which is made out of tree bark. Sometimes in the Pacific Islanders do this, and some of the some natives around the world they make in India also they make with uh, with bark of tree they can make cloth type of cloth. So in this way, one should learn to be satisfied in any material situation. One should have firm faith that he will achieve success by following the instructions of the literature that describes the glories of the Supreme Lord. At the same time, one should avoid blaspheming other scriptures. So, for instance, we have the 18 Mahapuranas, and three, uh, three, six of them are in the mode of goodness, six of them are in the mode of passion, and six in the mode of ignorance. Those Puranas which are in the mode of ignorance and passion, we can still take things from those Puranas as long as they don't, um, as long as they don't, um, they don't preach against principles of Vaishnavism. But we should refrain from from we should refrain from blaspheming those because they are scriptures which are used by certain people who are in those modes of nature, and they gradually elevate those people. Even the Dharma Shastras, we may criticize some of the rules of Manushmriti or whatever it is like that. But we but we we have to appreciate whatever is good in that scripture, and uh, we have to reject whatever goes against Vaishnava principles. But we shouldn't we shouldn't blaspheme such scriptures. One should rigidly control his mind and speech and bodily activities, always speak the truth and bring the mind and senses fully uh, under full control. One should hear, glorify, and meditate upon the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. Indeed, one should be absorbed in hearing and chanting about the names, forms, qualities, and pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Simultaneously, one should perform one, all of one's activities as an offering to the Lord. Everything that we do, 
Right? What does Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita? He says, Yat Tarosi Yadas Nasi, Yat Jahosi Dadasi, Yat Yat Tapasi Sikonte, Yat Takurushwamadarpana. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer and give away, do that as an offering to me. So everything that we should do, we follow it. Uh, actually, we follow it by saying, uh, I am all of this I'm offering to you, whatever I'm doing with my mouth, with my brain, my mind, my hands, my body, whatever I'm doing like that, whatever I, I attempt to do, I'm offering all of the fruit of all those activities back to the Supreme Lord. This is called, um, by Ramanujan, this is called Satvika Tyaga. Satvika Tyaga means it's, it's beyond the mode of goodness or in the mode of goodness, and it is, it is renunciation in the mode of goodness. We are renouncing the fact that we are the doer of, an, of some activity. We do something, and, but, the, but the result of that action actually belongs to the Lord because he's the real doer. Because in the Bhagavad Gita also it says there are five, there are five causes of action. The Lord himself is one of them. So without the Lord, no action occurs. So every action, he's the doer. So he is the doer of all those actions. Therefore, all those good actions that we perform, he's the doer of that. He gets the benefit. The benefit actually accrues to him. Like that. We should never take the, try to take the benefit for ourselves. So one should, uh, one sh indeed, one should become absorbed. Okay. Any, any sacrifice, charity, or penance that one executes should be done for the Lord's satisfaction. Do it for him. Similarly, one should only chant mantras that glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's very interesting, right? Where is this from? Is this from the Bhagavatam? Or is it? It's the Bhagavatam, naturally. Very good. So one should... Uh, one, should only, one should only chant mantras that glorify the Supreme Personality of God. And so if there are mantras for other deities, we, should, we, should, we don't need to chant those mantras. We need to chant the mantras which glorify the Supreme Personality of God, in, like the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, like, uh, like the mantras of the Bhagavatam, like the slokas of the Bhagavatam, right? There are so many mantras that glorify the Supreme Personality of God. There are so many Vishnu mantras, right? Just like there was a discussion in the second Vilas of Hare Bhakti Vilas about different types of, there was a discussion about maybe it's the end of the first Vilas, right? End of the first Vilas, where it talks about different mantras, or maybe in the second Vilas, I'm not sure. Different mantras for initiation. And as they talk about mantras, that the Vishnu mantras are millions of times better than mantras for Ganesh or any other Devata, like that. So the Vaishnava, he's only interested in using these mantras, which ha have a relationship to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And means also and his and his consort and, and his consorts and his associates and his entourage, his retinue. So whatever one finds pleasing should also be offered to the Supreme Lord, even if his wife, even his wife, his children, his home, and his life. So his very life. We should think of all of these things as being the possessions of the Lord, not as our possessions. We have nothing, we own nothing. We are a possession. Our position is that we are a possession of the Lord. We are his possession. If we think even that we belong to ourselves, that is stealing the soul away from God, right? It is his possession. The soul is his possession. We are his possession. Our body is his possession. Our wife, our home, our children, our family, our very life, all belongs to him. One who actually desires his ultimate self-interest should cultivate friendship with, with, with sincere, it should be, with sincere devotees of, of Lord Krishna. At the same time, one should develop an attitude of service toward all living beings by helping them to advance in Krishna consciousness. That is the real benefit for all living beings. So just feeding people or just opening hospitals or digging wells so people can have fresh water, whatever it is. These are materialistic activities. They're, they're, they're punya karmas. They're good activities, right? And you certainly can go to the heavenly planets by doing all these good activities. But to really benefit people, you have to give them Krishna consciousness, you have to give them Vaishnavism, you have to explain to them their role in this material world and how to get out from this material world, how that they are the, they are also the, the eternal servants of God, and they need to re-engage in his service, in his loving service. One should uh, especially render service to the pure devotees of the Lord. 
So we should, we should render service to all living beings. We should be interested in the welfare of all living beings, but particularly the pure devotees, particularly the Vaishnavas, we have to render service to the Vaishnavas. One should learn how to associate with devotees of the Lord by gathering with them and chanting the glories of the Lord. This process is, is most purifying. As devotees thus develop their loving friendship, they feel mutual happiness and satisfaction. And by encouraging one another, they're able to give up material sense gratification, which is the cause of all suffering. So also in the Bhagavatam, 11th canto, 11th chapter, text 34 to 41, the Supreme Lord has said to Uddhava, my dear Uddhava, one can give up all sense of false prestige by engaging in the following devotional activities. One should purify himself by seeing, touching, worshipping, serving, and offering prayers and obeisances to the deity and, and, and to my pure devotees. So, Aradhananam Sarvesham Vishnu Aradhanam Param Tasma Paradhanam Devi Tariyanam Taachanam. What is related to Krishna is also considered to be extremely pure, and that is his devotees. So, not only the deity, but also his devotees by touching, worshipping, serving, offering prayers and obeisances. One should also hear and glorify my transcendental qualities and pastimes and thus always meditate upon me. One should offer to me whatever one has in his possession and accepting one as my eternal servant, one should give oneself completely to me, completely surrender to me. Right? As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Sarvadharmam parichajam, He says to Arjuna, just abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. Right? I will protect you from all fear right? and, uh, and give, you, uh, give you liberation from the reactions of all sinful activities and I will, you will attain liberation. Don't fear. Okay. One should offer to me whatever is in one, his possession, accepting oneself as my eternal servant. One should give oneself completely to me. This is called Atmani Vedana or Sharanagati or property. One should means self-surrender. So one should Enjoy uh, life by participating in the festivals such as Janmastami, Ramanavami, all these other appearances, Narasimha Jayanti, the different festivals that we have during the, during the year. And glorify my pastimes by singing, dancing, playing musical instruments, and discussing me with other devotees. One should observe religious vows such as Ekadasi. Right? So again, we're hearing about ecodicy. We're going to hear much more about ecodicy coming up. And take initiation according to the procedures mentioned in the Vedic literature. So not only do we have to feel internally you know, that, we, that we are the servant of the Lord and that we're surrendered to him, but we also should actually take the proper initiation, the proper diksha, right? which was explained in the second uh, vilas of Haribak vilas. One should faithfully support and in the installation of my deity, one should, if you can't personally help yourself to install the deity, then you can pay other people to do that or you can, you can arrange for the Lord to be installed in your house or in your local temple and work for the construction of my temples and villages as well as flower gardens and fruit orchards to support the temples, to support the worship of the Lord. We have to have fruits. We have to have flowers. So we need flower gardens. We need fruit orchards. We also need to grow grains. We need to have milk products. We need to have all these things, right? So agriculture is also important because everything is important. Every activity is important. We have to offer the results of that activity to the Lord. One should consider oneself to be a humble servant without duplicity and thus help to clean my temple. So even if you are a very great person, like the king of Puri, right? He was sweeping in front of the Rathiyatra card of Lord Jagannath. He was sweeping the road. Right, sweeping the road is is the, is usually the job for a very low class person sweeping the road. But the king of Puri did sweep in front of the chariot of Lord Jagannath, in front of Lord Jag Jagannath's Ratutsava, Rata, his chariot. So that was interesting. It's interesting that uh, that section is that uh, that the the uh, I think it was the the. The daughter of a king in South India, a Vaishnav king in, of, of, the, of uh, the Vijayanagara Empire, was going to marry the son of, um, of, of the king of Orissa, like that. 
But then they heard a rumor that the, that, the, that the father, the king of Orissa, was the king of Puri, used to sweep in front of Lord Jagannath. So when they heard this rumor that the king was sweeping, he was a sweeper. So then the, then the king in South India thought, wow, I don't want to marry my princess daughter to a sweeper son, to the son of a sweeper, like that. But then when it was explained, when it's explained that actually he was sweeping in front of the Supreme Lord, that's okay. He's actually a king. He's not a sweeper, but so just like that, we may, uh, Prabhupada also mentioned this sometimes, I may sweep. Even Prabhupada used to clean and do menial tasks. He used to cook, he used to clean, he used to do so many things as an example to all of us, right? But that doesn't mean that he, Prabhupada was a cook or Prabhupada was a sweeper, right? So the Vaishnava can take to all these activities and he can do all of these things. It doesn't mean that he is associated with the, the lowness or highness, the high, the low or high social status of that particular activity. So one should consider oneself my humble servant without duplicity, and one should help to clean the temple. Cleaning the temple is not considered to be a sweeper's work. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu cleaned the temple of Lord Jagannath, the Gundicha Mandir in Puri, and all of his devotees came and helped to clean the temple. They didn't, they were all brahmanas. They're not. Sometimes you think when you go to India, you see so many dirty, you go to places and you think, why is it so dirty here? It's because the Brahmanas think, no, I can't do this. I'm a Brahman. I can't clean. Like that. Yeah? Because I'm high class, I can't clean. Like that. that that's for sweepers. That's for the cleaners to do. That's their job to do that. Like that. You see this if you go in the train journey or something like that, people will make a big mess and They'll, and you say, why are you making a mess here, like this in the train? Oh, no, somebody will come. His, his, somebody's job is to come and clean. So if we don't make a mess, that person will be out of a job. You know, they'll say. So we should make a mess so that that boy that comes and, and sweeps, he will have a job like that. Otherwise, if we clean up after ourselves, there'll be no job for this boy, poor boy like that. So this is some mentality like that. But actually, here... The, the Lord's house, the Lord's temple, the devotees of the Lord, doesn't matter what social position they're in, they should all try to help clean the Lord's temple. Mandira Marjana. Mandira Marjana. That's stated. That, and the guru, the spiritual master, is happy when he sees, when he sees the disciples doing that. And he also shows them, just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu personally washed the Gurdicha Mandir. He didn't he didn't say, oh, I'm the big guru, uh, you, you shishas, you, you disciples, you go and you wash them. You go and you wash the temple of Jagannath. You get the water and you wash. And then I'll come when the deity comes. Okay. No, no, he personally got in there. He was the greatest Vaishnava. He was the greatest uh, devotee of Lord Krishna, right? He was a sannyasi. He was supposed to be the guru of the Manashram system, but he went and personally cleaned, personally cleaned the temple of the Lord. So one should not think that they're, uh, that they're above the menial cleaning or sweeping, right? First, one should sweep, right? Sweeping is like cleaning your heart, actually. First, one should sweep. Then one should cleanse with water and cow dung, okay? So there's, there's a different ways of doing it. Some people say you have to put down some water first because if there's dust, if you sweep, the dust will, will come up. And when the dust comes up into the air, it, it may get on the deity or it may, you know, get somewhere where it's not supposed to be. The best thing is to throw a little bit of water down and then you sweep and then you mop, right? And then afterwards, if you want to clean, you can clean with cow dung, which is antiseptic. And sometimes that's mixed with pure earth like that. And they make a nice, um, a nice floor like that. Or if the, if the temple already has a, has, a, has a nice floor, then you can just wash it with water like that some other antiseptic maybe. After one, after one should sprinkle scented water and decorate the temple with mandalas. Mandalas are these different designs. Actually, the, what we're doing is we're not actually doing it with mandalas. A mandala is a design which you usually worship, so we don't usually, uh, we, we won't usually do that. It's, in South India, they call this sort of thing polan in Tamil or ranguli in Kannada, in Telugu, Rang, Rang, rangavali, ranguli. Rangavali would be Sanskrit. And it means auspicious diagrams, auspicious diagrams, not necessarily to be worshipped, right? But 
of some auspicious thing, some auspicious thing, such as a lotus or such as a, um, you know, a swastika or something like this, right? In this way, one should, uh, one should act just like my servant. So we should think of the, 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 the temple like a palace of the Lord, and we should worship just as if we're, just as if we're the servants in the, in, the, in the great man's house, in the great man's palace the king of kings palace. A devotee should never advertise his devotional activities so that they will be the cause of false pride. So this is very interesting. I'll tell you a story. So I was doing research on Chaturmasya. Chaturmasya is the four months of the rainy season and people do different things. They grow beards, they, they do fasting, they chant more japa, they chant some more mantras every day. They, 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 eat, very, they eat food without spices, without ghee. You know, there's a lot of different things that they, that they do. They don't sleep. They sleep less or they sleep on the floor. Or they don't sleep with a the blanket. There's many, many, many different things. They give up salt. So, so for these four months, the different devotees will be doing different uh, uh, activities like this, austerities, penances. Now, some devotees you'll see, they'll tell you, oh, yes, yes, uh, Chattamasya, I'm going to, I'm going to chant 64 rounds every day. I'm going to chant so much every day like that. The devotee will tell you. But here it's specifically said, specifically said, this is from the Bible time, right? Yes, Bible time. It specifically said, don't advertise. Don't advertise. Why do we, what is the reason why we have the bead bag? Why do we have the mala, the japa mala inside the bag? Yeah, okay. We don't want, we want the, the mala, we don't want to get the mala dirty. So we keep it in the bag because maybe we take it with us somewhere, you know, and we might chant. So we don't want it to get dirty, but the but the reason is also we don't want to advertise how many how many rounds we're chanting, how many times we're chanting, like that. What how great are my devotional activities? Oh, I'm doing a big abhishek in the thousand parts, or I'm doing a I'm doing a festival, and uh, uh, a ritual that takes ten days or something that I'm worshiping the Lord, on, or I'm worshiping the Lord with a thousand lotuses dipped in ghee and throwing into the fire, like that. So we, we should never advertise our devotional activities as being great, being so great, because this is a source of false pride, and that false pride, or ahankara, destroys the, 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 the spiritual advancement that we make from doing all these activities. So actually, I, I was asking uh, a man called Dr. Ghosh, who was a reader in Sanskrit at the Vrindavan Research Institute, I was saying to him, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, what do they do during Chattamasya? What kind of devotional activities do they do? He said, well, some people, they fast and, and they chant more rounds. And so I asked him, I said, well, what do you do? What, what does this person do? Like that, oh, we, 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 won't, we won't say. They won't say. They don't, they, they're too shy to say. They will not say. Because they don't want to advertise their devotional activities as being great. So one should never use lamps that are offered to me for other purposes, Right? So we have a lamp or something that is, or we've offered to the, the deity that becomes prasadam. So we shouldn't say, oh, and now I've got a lamp. You know, I should go and use it for, you know, put it out the front to, of the house or uh, make it. Uh, I've got a, a shed over there. I need a la light in. I'm going to put it in there to light the, you know, we shouldn't use it in a disrespectful way. Similarly, one should never offer me anything that has been used by others, right? So we don't offer. So here it's also saying never use. Never use lamps that are offered to me for other purposes. And we shouldn't also use those lamps, right? We offer those lamps to other people before, right? So we can't offer a lamp. We can't offer a lamp to any other personality before we offer it to Krishna. We have to offer it to Krishna first. And after offering it to Krishna, it becomes Krishna's prasadam, and then we can offer it to other personalities, including his consort, his associates, his, his devotees, and the different acharyas from senior to junior. And similarly, we cannot offer anything, food or <clears throat> incense or any, any other item that we offer in worship. We have to always offer the first, first freshly, we have to offer that thing to God. Now, somebody will counter and say, well, don't, aren't we supposed to offer everything to the guru first? Yes, you can go and you can take permission from the guru and say, my dear guru, you're engaging me in worshiping the Lord. So please give me permission to approach the Lord and to offer this to the Lord. And then when the, after the Lord accepts that, then we give to the Guru. 
Or if we if we want a, a garland for the guru, then we go and offer that that garland to the Lord. Offer that garland to the Lord, or at least touch it to the Lord's feet and offer it to the Lord. So whatever we have, in some some cases, people offer their clothes, they offer their tulsi beads, they offer their everything that we have. We can offer to the Lord first when it's fresh, when it's new, and then it becomes the Lord's prasadam, and we can accept it. So this is the this is the situation. If if somebody says, well, we have to offer to the to the to the to the guru first. Okay, if you have to do a separate puja for the guru and you're offering something to the guru, but then you can't offer that thing, what does it say here? One should never offer to me anything that's used by others. So we can't offer a fresh lamp. We offer we're offering it to the guru, and then we can't offer it to the Lord. If we offer incense, whatever whatever it is, we should not offer something which has been offered before to the Lord. It's been it's been offered to somebody before. The first person who gets it is the Lord. Now, if there are lots of deities around and we're offering, we're offering incense multiple times or, you know, or lamps multiple times, then we offer it first of all to the Lord and then we're offering it to other. other to, to, but the idea is to first honor the Lord with anything. Everything has to be offered to the Lord first. Whatever is most dear to oneself, one should offer to me. Indeed, such an offering qualifies one. For eternal life. Now, another thing, the last thing about this uh, offering to the guru first or offering to the Lord first. Okay, so if, we, if you say we should offer something to the Lord first, or to the guru first, if we're offering something to the guru, then, the, then if we're doing the offering, right, we should just simply take permission from the guru to worship the Lord and offer it to the Lord. If, however, right, if we're not doing the offering, we give it to the guru, the guru will then offer it to the Lord. He'll offer it to the Lord first. If we prepare food for the guru, if we prepare food for our family, if we prepare food for our wife or our husband, like that, first of all, we offer it to the Lord. Then we offer it to the family, the wife, the husband, the guru, like that, whoever. After it's been offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and it becomes Krishna Prasad, then it can be offered to others, not before. It's just obvious. Okay, so... Um, we, had, we saw the same thing when we were worshipping the deity. We offered food to the deity of the Lord. And then afterwards, some of it was given to Vishvatsena, and then some of it was distributed to the devotees of the Lord afterwards. So like that. So, so the same thing with everything. With everything. Now, sometimes, uh, if we're worshipping a whole lot of deities together, we will worship, we will worship the spiritual master and we'll worship the uh, attendant deities, uh, you know, the associates of the Lord up to a certain point. And then we'll continue to do the worship of the Lord up to a certain point. For instance, we have to think about this. So when we wake the deities up in the, in the morning, if we're waking up the Lord in the morning and we have other deities like the spiritual master, so are you saying we, that wake up should be first for the Lord? No, the waking up of the should be first for the guru. The servants always get up before the master. So we, should, we, should, we need to get up uh, the servants and then the, the associates of the Lord and the Lord's consorts, and then we wake up the Lord. Right. Whereas when the Lord sleeps, the Lord sleeps first. The Lord sleeps first, and then his consorts and his associates, and then his the gurus and senior to junior, because they're the servants of the Lord. So we have to be thinking in that way. Similarly, we can do we can get the spiritual master up, and we can or the deity of the spiritual master. We can do all the puja up to the point of him being dressed and wearing tilak and having his sacred bread and everything like that. And then at that point. We can take permission from him and we can request him to help us to worship the Lord. Then we should do, worship the Lord completely until he's completely decorated and, and fully, fully, um, fully worshipped. Then with flowers and with tulsi and with incense and with lamps and with food that we've offered to the Lord, we can then finish the worship of the spiritual master or of the attendant deity like that. We always have to be, be thinking about the way. Now, if you are worshipping deities separately, you have a separate pujari with separate items for separate people, then, of course, we are offering those things. But we're all in one temple on the same altar or something like that. Somebody else is worshipping the Lord, and another pujari is worshipping the spiritual master, another pujari is worshipping Gornathai, another pujari is worshipping Sakana, another pujari is worshipping Krishna Bhagavan, like that, at the same time. It's all happening simultaneously with different items like that. But when we have the same items... We have to think very carefully of the order. 
So the order has to be always, when we're offering something fresh, it has to be always offered in a descending order from the Lord down to the Guru, to the first one. And, but for, for instance, uh, in, terms of, in terms of waking up in the morning, the servants have to get up first. So all, all of this we have to think as if the personalities are actually standing before us. So deity worship is, is simply, deity worship is simply meditation. Right, and we and we do the external things in the same way that we would do in our meditation if the personality was standing directly in front of us. Okay, so um, we're going to continue on a little bit. Uh, just one moment. So continue on, um, text five fourteen to five seventeen, Shri Bhagavatam eleventh canto nineteenth chapter verses twenty to twenty three. These verses are to be found. Firm faith in narrations of my pastimes, constant chanting of my glories, unwavering attachment to the worship of the deity, the, the offering of beautiful prayers, great respect for my devotional service, offering obeisances by falling flat on the floor, flat to the floor, um, performing very respectful worship of my devotees, consciousness of me as being present in all living entities, Offering of all bodily activities in my devotional service, engagement of the tongue in describing my qualities, offering the mind to me, rejecting all material desires, giving up wealth for my devotional service, renouncing material sense gratification and happiness, and performing all pious activities such as charity, sacrifice, performing all pious activities such as charity, sacrifice, vows, and austerities for the purpose of achieving me, these constitute actual religious principles. This is very nice. 11th Canto. Texts 518 to 521. In the Shura Bhagavatam 11th Canto, 29th chapter, verses 9 to 12, these verses are found. While always remembering me, one should perform his duties without a, a feverish mentality. With mind and intelligence fixed upon me, one should engage in my devotional service. One should take shelter of a holy place where my devotees reside, and one should be guided by the exemplary activities of my devotees, who appear among demigods, demons, and human beings. So this is very interesting. We should live in a holy place, right? So in Chaitanya Charamrita, uh, Lord Chaitanya actually says there are five things. So Sadhusanga Nama Kirtana Bhagavad Shravasa Matura Vasa Sri Matira Shraddhiya Sivanna, right? So um, Sadhusanga, we should associate with devotees. Matura Vasa, Sadhusanga, Nama Kirtana, we should chant the holy name. Uh, Matura Vasa, we should live in a holy place. And a holy place can even be our house if we have the deity of the Lord in our house or Shalagams. Um, uh, Sadhusanga Nama Kirtana Bhagavad Shravasa Matura Vasa, Matura Vasa Sri Matira Shraddhiya Sivanna. Uh, we, we should study the Bhagavatam, study the Bhagavatam, it's live in a holy place like Mathura and, uh, <clears throat> and worship the Supreme Lord with faith and devotion, right? Sri Muthira Shradhyaya Sivanna. We have to worship the, worship the, the, the deity of the Lord in, with uh, all faith and devotion. So one should take shelter of a holy place where my devotees reside and one should be guided by the exemplary activities of my devotees who, are, who, are, who appear among demigods, demons, and human beings. So there are not only human Vaishnavas, there are demon Vaishnavas, demon Vaishnavas and demigod Vaishnavas. So, for instance, the Prahlad was born in the family of demons. Bali Maharaj was also his grandson, so he was born in the family of demons. So they were actually Vaishnavas, but they were born in the family of demons. So similarly, we read in Harivakti Vilas, we also read about Sat Sudra. Somebody is born a Sudra, like Haridas Thakur was born in the Muslim family. So we have people who are born Sudras, right? But they became Vaishnavas and they elevated themselves. They're called Sat Sudras, like in Harivakti Vilas. So either alone or in the association of devotees, one should celebrate my holy festivals with singing, dancing, and worship of me with great opulence. With a pure heart, one should see me, the, super, the supreme soul, as present within all living beings and also within oneself. I am present everywhere, both externally and internally, just as the omnipresent sky. So just like the sky, the Lord, the Supreme Lord Krishna is everywhere. Atha Bhagavad Dharma Mahatyam. So the glories of Bhagavad Dharma. Prahlad spoke the following verse in Sri Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, 7th chapter, verse 33. By these activities, as mentioned above, one can curb the influence of his enemies, who are our real enemies, namely lust, anger, greed, illusion, uh, madness, and jealousy, right? 
And when thus situated, one can render loving devotional service to the Lord. Text 523, Narada spoke this verse, which is found in Sri Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, 2nd chapter, verse 12. Pure devotional service rendered to the Supreme Lord is so potent that simply by hearing about it, by chanting its glories, by meditating upon it, by faithfully accepting it, and by praising the service of others, even persons who are envious of the demigods and, who, and, and other living beings can be immediately purified. Nice. So this is about devotional service is so great. Text 524. Kavi has spoken this following verse in the Sri Bhagavatam 11th Canto, 2nd chapter, verse 35. O king, one who accepts the devotional service as the supreme personality of Godhead will never stumble on his path in this world. Even while running with eyes closed, he will never trip or fall. <laughs> Interesting. Right, this is a very, very, this is like Shastri hyperbole. So he's saying, look, if you have, if you accept the devotional service of the Supreme Personality of God, Lord Krishna, you will never stumble in your path. So then he says, even if you're running on your path, even if you're running madly and passionately on your path, with your eyes closed, you will never trip or fall. Huh. It's very, very nice, very nice illusion here. Text 525. Prabhuda spoke this verse in Sri Bhagavatam 11th Canto, 3rd chapter. Verse 33, by learning the science of devotion and practically engaging in the devotional service of the Lord, one will come to the stage of love of Godhead. In this way, a devotee easily crosses over the illusory, the illusory energy, maya, which is extremely difficult to transcend. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Mama Maya Duratya, my maya is very difficult to overcome it. Text uh, 526, the Supreme Lord spoke this verse, which is found in Bhagavatam, uh, 11th canto, 19th chapter, verse 24. My dear Uddhava, the supreme religion for human society is the religion whereby one can awaken his dormant love for me. Text 527, a little later in Sri Bhagavatam, 11th canto, 29th chapter, verse 20, he says, my dear Uddhava, because I have personally established it, the process of devotional service unto me is transcendental when performed without any material motivation. Certainly a devotee will never suffer even the slightest loss by adopting this process. Text 528. If he cannot find an association of devotees, then one who is learned in the scriptures should speak about the Supreme Lord to inquisitive persons, either at home or in the temple. Right, so if you can't find other uh, devotees to associate, then preach. Then preach to other persons, people who are non-devotees. You can do it in a temple, you can do it in your home, you can do it anywhere. Text 529. Atashri Bhagavad Lila Kata Kirtana Mahapyam, the, the glories of praising narrations of Krishna's pastimes. The Supreme Lord spoke this verse to Arjuna, which is found in the Skanda Purana. One who always speaks about my glories to the Vaishnavas will pass his time happily in this life and achieve liberation after death. There is no doubt about this. Text 530. Narada has spoken this verse in the Sri Bhagavatam, first canto, fifth chapter, verse 22. Learned authorities have positively concluded that the actual purpose of the advancement of knowledge, namely austerity, study of, study of the Vedas, right, sacrifice, chanting of mantras, and charity, culminates in descriptions of the Lord who is described by nice poetry. Text 531 from Sri Bhagavatam, first canto, sixth chapter, text 35. It's also stated, I have personally experienced that those who are always full of anxiety due to, constant, to constantly desiring contact of the senses with their objects can cross over, can cross the ocean of nescience in, a, in the most suitable boat. The boat is? the constant chanting of the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. They are, a, they are like a boat which can help us to cross the ocean of nescience, the ocean of, of, of uh, avidya, the ocean of ignorance, right, of darkness. Text 532. Sukadeva Swami spoke the following verse in Sri Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, 31st chapter, verse 28. The all auspicious pastimes of the all attractive incarnations of Lord Sri Krishna, as well as the pastimes he performed as a child, are described in the Sri Bhagavatam and other Vedic literature. 
Anyone who chants these narrations will attain transcendental loving service unto Lord Krishna, who is the goal of all great sages. Nice. Text 533, Pallad Maharaj has offered this prayer to Lord Narasimhadev, uh, as found in Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, 9th Chapter, verse 18. Oh, my Lord Narasimhadev, by engaging in your transcendental loving service in the association of liberated devotees, I will certainly become free from the association of the three modes of material nature and thus able to chant your glories. I shall chant your glories following in the footsteps of Lord Brahma and his disciplic succession. In this way, I will undoubtedly be able to cross the formidable ocean of material existence. Text 534. The gopis of Braja spoke this verse, which is found in the Shura Bhagavatam, 10th Canto, 31st chapter, text 9. The nectar of your words and the descriptions of your pastimes are the life and soul of those suffering in this material world. These narrations transmitted by learned devotees eradicate one's sinful reactions and bestow good fortune upon all, or all those who hear them. These narrations, which are filled with spiritual potency, are broadcast all over the world. Those who relay the messages of Godhead are the most munificent personalities. Text 535. The glories of hearing apply to the glories of chanting as well. After all, by chanting, one automatically hears. One can hear from others or hear his own chanting. Text 536. Only a person who is well-versed in the Shastra, in the scriptures, should be allowed to speak. However, if there is no such speaker, then even if there are not so many inquisitive learners, one should never give up discussing topics about the Supreme Lord. One can always discuss narrations of the Supreme Lord in the association of his friends, brothers, children, and other family members as, pre as presented by saintly persons, right? So only a person who's well, who's well-versed in the Shastra should be allowed to speak. Right? However, if there is no such person, and normally the persons who are going to speak, they will feel themselves humble and they will feel themselves inadequate to speak, right? If they are true Vaishnavas, right? So, the, so, however, if there is no such speaker, then even if there are not so many, even if there are not so many inquisitive learners, even if there's only one inquisitive learner, even if you're speaking for yourself for your own benefit, and there's no one else around. One should never give up discussing the topics about the Supreme Lord. One can always discuss narrations of the Supreme Lord in the association of friends, brothers, children, and other family members as presented by saintly persons. So that means we want to, we want to, we want to find out these, these shastras. We want to find out the meaning of the shastras in the association of saintly persons, right? Or as presented by the saintly persons with the purport by the saintly persons. With the, with the commentary of the Acharyas, of the, of the great Vaishnavas, like that, so that we don't misunderstand them, like that. So thus ends the translation of the 10th class of Haribakti Lama.